Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video view series for take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the 10th level Hex Dungeon, The Great Trial Frostbite, designed by Christian Zoich for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my content, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. So this is a, I guess, a direct sequel to The Great Trial, which I reviewed back in uh, last year, last fall, uh, which was a hex crawl dungeon, basically inspired by classic, I guess, death trap dungeons, like Tomb of Horrors or something, but in this case, kind of with multiple levels, and, you know, one of them was a hex crawl, one of them was just a deadly, you know, trap full of dungeons, uh, traps, dungeon full of traps. This one is kind of a follow-up where you could uh, transition your characters from The Great Trial into The Great Trial Frostbite, so it could be a direct sequel, or it just could be a standalone adventure. You could ignore the first one and just safely use uh, this one. That's probably the better way to go about it, because I can imagine your players wanting to do this kind of adventure immediately again, unless they're really into the pure like video game hack-and-slash kind of gameplay, which some groups totally are, and that's fine. That's kind of what you're going to get here, too, is a, is a, a focus on... Um, big scale fights, and there's some really cool fights in here. Like it's a lot of custom uh, boss monster stat blocks. If your if your players like fighting, and they tend to meta game a little bit, just not even maybe through fault of their own, but just because years of playing D and D fifth edition, you know, you can recognize a lot of monsters and what they do, and it's hard to turn that off. Uh, this has a lot of custom boss monster fights, which is really cool. And it's for 10th level, which is also pretty neat because that's not a level you often see content produced for on the DMs Guild. Uh, the original Great Trial was for 7th level, might have included a level up in there somewhere. Whereas this one is solidly, uh, we're near the end of tier 2, I believe, at level 10. So that's pretty cool to see. Uh, overall, I think it's better than the Great Trial. The uh, ice theme is more interesting, and I think it has a cooler concept when it comes to, hey, here's this uh, overland map area divided into hex, you know, hexes, so it's a hex crawl that you have to explore, and there are certain points you have to reach. In this case, it's basically entirely optional because all those different locations, where's the actual map? There we go. Um, all these locations weaken the boss, which is also on this page, this named Death, and he rides an undead with our named Wings. So together they are Death Wings. That's pretty dorky, but we'll go with that. Um, who roams around uh, basically the area the players have to reach, which is a portal on the top of the mountain. So that's kind of a neat setup. The actual adventure hooks are okay. Um, one of them is actually from another product that Zoish did, which was um, called Encounters in Icewind Dale, which was one of the encounters in that book, which was a giant with basically a note like tied to it that invited the players to come to a certain area where this wizard would then uh, basically attack them, take them down, and then transport into his hellish zone where he tests them for reasons. It's, it's, I mean, it's basically very like Halister-like or, I mean, even a Serac to an extent where it's just... Some super powerful sorcerer has apparently nothing better to do but just create dungeons for heroes to go. I mean, it's very much like the setup of like a roguelike dungeon crawl or something without, you know, you take the mechanics of an RPG but kind of lose the actual like RP part of it so much. It's not really a lot of social role playing opportunities here, which again is fine if you're into that kind of thing and you're not really looking for it. Uh, you're going to get a lot of fights. But it's, it's an interesting setup. Um, and. I think the the hex crawl is fine. It's at least better than the first Great Trial because that one involved a jungle, and of course the biggest hex crawl out there is Tomb of Annihilation, which is a big fucking jungle crawl. So I appreciate that this goes away from that, far enough away to make it an icy realm where there's a lot of different hazards, and you're actually rolling for hazards if there's um, you know snowstorms or just sleet or maybe there's ice everywhere or whatever's going on in addition to having random encounters I'm a little annoyed by the organization of this book where you, you list all the locations first which is important and then the random encounters that could, could possibly occur upon entering each hex after that I would have appreciated having those at the beginning so that I can see okay what is the rate of encounters here how is that supposed to affect the party's progress and then see the actual important locations. They begin here at the Tree of Bad Omen, where, you know, Magic Mouth appears and basically tells them, essentially, you're part of, like, this game show that's not really a show at all. It's just a demented wizard, you know, testing the heroes for reasons, whatever. 
Um, it actually would be more fun if it was a game show, I think. <laughs> it turned into a whole, like, event. And, uh, and they have to go to this tall guardian place to even get their stuff back, which that's the first location. They're, they're, all their equipment has been frozen in into the ice blocks. Which, if, if I could make a complaint, I'm not going to put this as an actual con, but I, I am not a fan. It has to be done very sparingly, where you basically capture the players and deposit them somewhere and they wake up. That's a very... Very tricky thing to pull off. I've mentioned this in several different adventures that do this. And there's always a big caveat there where, I mean, in this case, yes, Anor is a super powerful high-level wizard with all these crazy spells and scrolls available. But it just feels like the DM just has a cheat mode on. And, I mean, it kind of sucks in video games, too. Video games do this a lot where you're up against, you know, the big boss shows up and just and, and it goes into combat mode and just fucking wipes your party out. And then, of course, it's, oh, it's not game over. The story continues and you were supposed to lose. That's how all of these work and it feels even worse in a in a tabletop rpg with an actual dm because it really feels like they're it's just cruel at that point and just and i don't know what the good answer is because i think a lot of good stories can start with the players being captured and waking up in an unknown location having to escape there so i'm not against that as a as a story conceit but the concept of just using a super powerful uh combat encounter to just wipe your poor heroes out where they have no, and in this case, it was just meeting somebody at a bar, and they just kind of go nuts with a, a combat fight, and there actually is a, a battle map for that. Um, just feels, I don't know, I'm, I'm just not a big fan of, of how that works in any adventure. Um, I didn't quite make it a, a con in this one, because I had some more pressing concerns that I'll include, but something to keep in mind is... I think it's doable to, you know, strip your players. I think it's easier maybe to begin a campaign at like that at level one, like how Out of the Abyss does it. Um, so that was just the way that adventure starts. But at level 10, like you're going to strip them of all their cool shit and just kick their ass with this big wizard. It, it doesn't quite feel uh, good. So I don't I, I don't know what the I don't know what the solution is there other than, you know, a portal opens up and you all get teleported or just, you know, do it in a cutscene. I guess would be the easiest thing. Just have a cutscene where the wizard shows up, knocks you all out. You know, and just don't make it a, a thing where the players feel like they're losing. Just like, hey, this is part of the story. Do you guys want to go on this adventure or not? And this is how we're going to start. <laughs> All right, rant over. So essentially, there's this powerful boss. He's a CR-16 um, custom, like, Death Knight stat blog with all these crazy abilities. And when you first see him, he, he roams around this mountain of the Frozen Peak. Um, and each of these hexes, by the way, is only a mile, which isn't too bad. And, uh, he can basically roam around within a one mile radius of the mountain, which as you can tell is a, is a pretty nice radius around the middle of this whole area. And he will attack anybody that gets near the mountain because that's their whole goal is just to escape. So unlike a lot of these kind of adventures where you have to go and, you know, collect keys or shut off, you know, the power grid or the fantasy version of that, you know, where you're having to do different things to, as a requirement to make it to the exit, in this case, you don't have to do any of the locations. You could just be, you could just do Zelda Breath of the Wild and beeline to that final location, fight this boss, and escape. Nothing prevents you from doing that, which is interesting. And I think that's cool that the designer kind of lets you do that. The reason you might want to go to all these different locations, however, is because, and you're supposed to be able to see this visually, the designer points it out, that all these locations have some kind of crystal or some kind of thing that is linked to this boss. And every time you destroy one of those things, you sever that link and it actually weakens the boss. Uh, mechanically, it removes one of his abilities, which is a really neat idea. I do have a... So, I think it's a, it's a pro and a con for me. It's a pro because I think that's a really cool idea is basically to say, hey, instead of putting up a bunch of, you know, colored gates or something with and you have to go get the colorful keys to match to make it to the exit so that we, you know, make sure you hit all the locations we want you to hit. We don't give a shit. You can go to the exit if you want, but there's this powerful boss and defeating all these things will weaken the boss, which, yes, is pretty much exactly how uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild works, and I think it works well there, too. Like, you can just beeline to the exit if you want, or you can go across, do all the things, and thus weaken that final boss fight and make it easier for you. The con side of this is I don't think this boss is strong enough to warrant that, which is a problem. Um, judging by his stat block, well, we can look at it in a second, but he loses a lot of these powerful abilities if you sever those links, which is helpful, but it's action economy. This dude does not have legendary action. He doesn't have legendary resistance either. Let's, let's actually skip down to where we can look at, um, death. It's named death. So is a CR 16. Uh, special, custom, cool Death Knight thing. He's got all these different abilities basically borrowed from other creatures. He's got different things that are on a recharge, which means he's probably going to get like one or two of those off anyway in a fight. 
Um, and keep in mind, these are all actions, so we can only do them once. And he's got spells. We could also cast spells as an action, although one of the uh, severers uh, does completely remove his spell casting, which is a big one. So my problem is he's honestly not that hard to just fight. I mean, again, 10th level players are nothing to sneeze at. Tenth, I mean, if you look at Tomb of Annihilation, that final dungeon crawl, the Tomb of the Nine Gods, is designed for level 9 through 11. Like, they're basically fighting not quite a Serac, because it would just show up at the end there. Spoilers, I guess, for Tomb of Annihilation, but... Like, 10th level players are pretty damn strong. They've got a lot of resources available to them. They can just... And yes, he is paired with this winged, uh, kind of custom, uh, slightly upscaled undead wyvern, which is a, a neat idea. But again, somebody could just knock it out of the sky. They could use, you know, whatever um, uh, hypnotic pattern or, you know, whatever else. He doesn't quite have enough... He doesn't even have immunities to all those things. Like, just shut him down with a hold monster or whatever else and go to town. Like, it's just not that difficult even with all of his abilities because of action economy. Like, he's only going to get one of these off. So that's a big problem I had because I like the idea so much, but you didn't make him strong enough to warrant the players to have to go across and do all that. The easiest thing would be to say, give him immunities to damage. If I was doing this, I would say, okay, if you don't sever any of his things, he's immune to all damage, he has invulnerability, you cannot hurt him. And everybody's going to say, oh shit, we got to start severing these and again you're supposed to be able to see these like spectral lines going across everywhere you know it's only each hex is only a mile so you can kind of follow these lines and go to each location and then do all those things um and then maybe you can go get interesting from there and say okay we severed this one now he's now we removed his resistance or his immunity to fire damage and then we removed this one now removed his immunity to slashing damage you know you could do it defensively and now you've got certain and now it becomes more tactically interesting and at the very least you have to give this guy legendary actions and legendary resistance and maybe one of the severs can remove his legendary resistance but if he's supposed to be the scary boss that roams around and, and harasses the players which by the way once you start severing enough of those connections, I think it's three or more, he is no longer chained to the mountain and he will actively hunt the players down, which is a neat concept again, but it just doesn't, he's not strong enough to warrant like any of this trouble that the party is going through. I mean, hopefully they just want to do the adventure anyway, but I think it'd be more um, interesting if he was way made ridiculously powerful instead of being like kind of strong make him ridiculously powerful because the whole concept here is severing these ties and thus making him more down to earth for just to where if you sever all his ties he's still a a strong boss fight you know instead of instead of you'd get rid of like almost all of his things and he just becomes kind of a normal just dude with you know almost 200 hit points but again just he's only one guy with that wyvern and by the way the other weird thing about the way this adventure is designed is that that wyvern this mounted undead wyvern that is supposed to be the thing the players realize gets them to the top of the mountain. For some reason, it says in the text, like, they can't really climb the mountain. It's just not really doable or feasible. It's like, okay, I'm not sure why. but um, So it's not even an actual proper location. Instead, the way they're supposed to reach the top, which is called the unreachable. <laughs> James Cameron work on this. Um, they're supposed to defeat the Death Knight and then ride his mount to the top. The mount, because he's, he's, he controls the beast with a, a certain item. That would not occur to most players. I think they would just defeat most uh, both monsters, and they may even defeat the fucking winged undead wyvern first, and thus knocking it out of the sky and, and putting him on the ground, which is not a bad strategy. But then they're shit out of luck in terms of getting to the final thing. The only backup plan is that they can meet up with the one optional social encounter here, which there's a, a dragonborn sorcerer who is from a previous party. He's been hiding out. He's been trying to help a few groups escape, but they've always failed, and he's always you know, basically just gone back into hiding. He can help the players. It's just a classic, like, DM PC, basically. who's just a powerful spellcaster. He's got, like, Fly and Polymorph, and he could help them reach the top. Um, I would make that more of a for-sure addition um, because this adventure otherwise completely lacks in social encounters other than that main wizard that comes and kicks your ass, and at the end he shows up and says, oh, thanks, here's your prizes. <laughs> thanks for playing. Um, so those are my big cons. Now, that being said, I actually do still like this adventure despite my those caveats because... All the locations are pretty interesting. They all fit the ice theme while still providing different cool things to do. Like there's a, a portal to the plane of ice that features a giant powerful ice golem. Um, there are demons and devils here. And one of the encounters you can meet is that they're fighting each other because that's what demons and devils do. So there's one of the locations has like an ice devil and there's a crystal there that you're supposed to destroy before this other army of devils basically shows up to wreck you. Uh, one of them has a giant gargantuan like demon slime that you have to fight. 
at one point there, in fact, you can see on this uh, map, uh, the Raging Wind, there's this um, giant tornado with uh, spawns air elementals that just roams around this like four hex pattern. And you have to make it to the middle of that tornado to then pluck the gem out. And that's kind of a giant skill challenge. So they're not all just boss fights, but there are some cool boss fights in there as well. So I, I generally like all these locations. One of them, uh, the Beholder, is a whole different um, uh, dungeon here. And you can actually bargain with the Ice Beholder. He does not like the does not like his situation. You know, he doesn't want to be trapped in here and doesn't like that he's tied to the death boss that roams around. So you can maybe bargain with him and enter kind of a social situation there. So each individual a area is pretty fun. And of course, what Zoich a lot of times provides in all of his products is really good maps. We get... Like, I think there's over a dozen um, full color battle maps with player and DM versions, which is always a huge thumbs up for me. So all of these little, you know, you've got this cool hex crawl map, which I would absolutely do to, you know, to provide the players that and, and give them a little, you know, overland symbol and move them along the map. And then whenever they actually make it to a location, then you can use one of these other maps and say, okay, now you're in the cave of Stygia, or now you're at the winner's eye or the plane of ice portal, and you can engage in this uh, battle or this scenario. And there's a lot of battles here. So all those locations are pretty cool, and I think they're, it's all an improvement over the original Great Trial, so that's a big thumbs up. And then the adventure doesn't actually end when you make it to that portal at the top of the mountain. Instead, we go to Chapter 2, which is this climactic chase sequence that reminded me so much of... Uh, hopefully some of you have played the Ori uh, games, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, or Ori and the... Whatever the Great Forest was called or something. Uh, really fun, like, action platformer, you know, Metroidvania. And it's a... In, in, in those games, you would have some boss fights that instead of fighting them, they would just chase after you. You know, it was a 2D. And it was like a platforming challenge. You just had to escape the boss. And if they ever touched you, you would basically just die. Um, and you would win whenever you escaped. That's what this is. This is a boss fight that you are not supposed to fight. You are supposed to run from. Because it is a custom ancient Draco Lich that wakes up as soon as you enter this portal. You can see this skeleton body right here does this cool cutscene where it rises up into this giant, you know, ancient Draco Lich with, I think it's like CR 21 or something. And you're not meant to fight it. And plus what's interesting here is the players, you know, level 10 players may have a chance against this thing, but assuming they've just experienced all these things, they may not have even long rested. Maybe they have once, but they're probably drained and thinking they made it to the, you know, the exit only to be dealt with this, like, climactic boss fight that's actually not a boss fight, it's a chase sequence, which is cool. And I think it's actually pretty well done because it's, you're given this map, so the players are allowed to pick different choices. Instead of having doors, you've got ice blocks, you have to actually, like, chip through them or do fire damage, you know, they've all got different AC and uh, hit points and things, and meanwhile, the dragon's trying to do the same thing. There are certain five-foot tunnels that the players can make it through, and then the dragon will have to go through a different way. It feels a little bit complicated for the DM because you're going to have to track the speed. You're going to have to track, you know, how long it takes for the dragon to make it and how far the players are making it. So it's a little bit trickier on the DM point of view. And obviously I would always err on the side of just making things exciting and cool. But the idea here is the players are not supposed to treat this as a stand-up fight. Instead, this thing can wreck them if it, if it ends up in a stand-up fight. And it will instead, you know, get close. And every time it gets close, maybe it can claw people. When it's in a, like a sharp tunnel, it can't really use its frost breath. You know, there's certain rules. And whenever it makes it to these different areas, the designer actually very helpfully points out, hey, if the players go this way, the dragon goes this way. If they manage to sneak into this tunnel, it's going to go around this way, which is really helpful. It doesn't just give them the map and say, all right, good luck, DMs. It actually spells things out and says, here's the best way to run this chase sequence. And then gives you all these additional, like, flavorful stat blo uh, dialogue boxes that you can even say to, to really get the action going and using things. So... I was very impressed because this is one of those ideas that se that sounds good as a concept, but then I wonder how does it actually work on paper? Like, how do you actually do a proper chasing with a boss monster in D and D? It feels very uh, complex, and the answer is it is complex. But at least this is probably the best version of one of those I've seen. And I think going through the tunnels and trying to break out through ice and having all these different you know paths to go in makes it pretty exciting. Now. There's a little bit of DM magic here in that the thing could be right behind you, but as soon as you make it to the exit, you're just magically done because, again, that godlike wizard just kind of watches over it, and as soon as you reach the exit, he just says, hey, you won, here's all your stuff. So there's not really a final, like, you know, it's it's a slightly anticlimactic at the end, even though I like this climax itself. Um, and there's nothing that says, what if the players actually defeat this thing? I don't think there's any, supposed to be any chance you can do that. thing has got like almost 400 hit points and does insane amounts of damage. I think you're supposed to allow a few attacks here and there if the players get close, but 
they're really not supposed to fight this thing. They're supposed to escape. And then they get rewarded with a bunch of special, you know, items and, and things. Although if they want to fight Aelinor, they or Aenor, they could, but it's not going to end very well because he already kicked their ass. So overall, I do have some complaints about the way this uh, dungeon is balanced, but I think it's a pretty cool idea if you enjoy very combat heavy, you know, gauntlet style or I, I struggle to use death trap dungeon because there's no actual traps in here. If you notice, it's very, very combat heavy. There's no, you know, unlike tomb of horrors or tomb of annihilation or whatever, there's not really any puzzle sequences or anything like that. The only real puzzle you have to figure out is to go to each location in order to weaken the boss. But then, as I mentioned, it doesn't really become that necessary because the boss is only really going to do one or two of these things. Anyway, how many rounds is going to really last before you're going to kick his ass? So I think with some proper rebalancing, and maybe some shuffling around of, uh, you know, changing some things here and there with the DM. This could turn into a really fun uh, combat heavy focused dungeon crawl. That's just kind of a whole side like, hey, you wake up in this, you know, icy hex crawl arena that you have to escape. And then at the end with having that climactic gargantuan like Draco Lich fight is a very cool ending. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for the Great Trial Frostbite uh, pro compelling locations that weaken the boss of the first area by removing its ability. So this is something that's going to be on a pro and a con. And the pro thing is that I like this concept. I like the, the breath of the wild concept of having a, a powerful, basically the fact that you can get to the end right away. But, uh, if you take your time and explore the regions and actually do those quests, then that makes that final area easier. I think it needs to be rebalanced, but I, I like that as a story, as, an, as a kind of pseudo open world like concept in order to motivate your players to go into those different areas. I think it works pretty well. Pro, the climactic chase sequence in an ice dungeon with a powerful undead dragon. So essentially, I like the concept of chapter one and I like the concept of chapter two. I think chapter two's execution works better ultimately to where I didn't have any really problems with it like I did with chapter one. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a really cool way to end that adventure. And I just think that's a neat, very video game-esque thing to do is you spawn in, there's this giant dragon that spawns and you just have to fucking run like hell as it claws after you. I think that's neat. Uh, pro, several custom monster boss monster stat blocks, including an ancient Draco Lich, huge ice elemental, gargantuan demon slime, and a CR-16 death knight. If your players are metagaming a lot of monsters, or you've gotten exhausted with a lot of the monsters that you've been using, this one has a lot of really cool, uh, like, boss arenas, basically. Like, half, half, if not more than half the locations are just boss arenas for these giant, cool, memorable... Um, Big time battles for your players. So I think that's a huge plus for this one. And the other pro is maps. You get maps for all these different locations, full color battle maps, player, DM versions, the whole shebang, which you should be used to from this designer's products. Cons, uh, that CR-16 Death Knight needs legendary actions and resistances to make it a more compelling threat. Because as it is, I don't even think it's worth shutting down any of its uh, abilities because it's only going to get, you know, two or three of things off anyway. It can't do its, you know, all of its... Special stuff is on recharge. The only one that might be worth shutting off is at spell casting, which is a huge nerf to its abilities. It just doesn't seem strong enough. Like it needs to be godlike. If you're if you're literally making seven different locations and ways to depower it, it needs to start like at a ten and then be lowered to like you know a six instead of starting at like a seven and be lowered to a four. Is how I'm picturing it. So it needs to be rebalanced there. And the other con is that the first chapter, this gauntlet, it lacks multiple avenues of escape. There's only that one area you can get to. And by design, the main thing the players are supposed to do is kill that Death Knight and ride its undead wyvern up to reach the exit. I don't think most players would realize that's even a freaking option, especially if they end up killing the wyvern first. So I, I would have preferred if, if the peak was its own location or there was something better that allowed them a different path to escaping. Or, or man, it'd be great if you could do some kind of branching path. So maybe you discover something the Beholder knows a different way out or that Dragonborn Sorcerer knows something else. Like, you know, it'd be cool to allow something to switch it up and, and give your players a little bit more choice in how they want to try to get out of the situation. Final verdict, The Great Trial Frostbite does everything right in a direct sequel, presenting another hex crawl dungeon with more interesting locations, bigger boss battles, and an epic climax. Thank you everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewanson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. You can support my work at patreon.com slash rogue. Watson. Shouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Manuel, Wizard, Princess, Christopher, Thomas, Captain Mike, Adam, Aiden, Instant Loose, Smog, Roger, Stan, and Nathan. And Gold Patrons, RPG, Paper Crafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Marcos, David, Vicente, Gilberto, Desert Lounge, Sam, Ross, Lumpy Spuds, Jerome, Fatboy, 619, Skelly, Nick, Party Mc, Butterpants, Blood, Angel, Veronis, Baboon, Baboon, Sean, AK, Cert, 2B, Nathan, and Fast Like a Tortoise. Thank you all very much for your support.